but for now, let's talk about my awkward finger guns. So today we are talking about volunteerism in the wildlife industry. Honestly, this is a really big topic and I'm a little bit nervous about tackling it, but I'm gonna try and sort of go into the nuance that is involved in the relationship between volunteerism and wildlife work in today's society and in where we are currently at with conservation. For anyone who doesn't know, when you combine volunteering and tourism, you get volunteerism. This is essentially when you travel somewhere that is probably a bit more unknown to you than your local area, and you essentially pay to volunteer and work on a project of some form. When people hear the word volunteerism, they probably more readily think of things like volunteering in orphanages, building houses, teaching children. I just want to make it very clear this is not the kind of volunteerism I am talking about. I'm actually quite uncomfortable with many forms of volunteerism like that, especially when you are working with children or other vulnerable people. What I am specifically talking about is volunteering with wildlife and really for this video volunteering on wildlife sanctuaries because that is where I think volunteerism really has a place in wildlife work. So this is when you will pay to go travel and generally live on site at a wildlife sanctuary and learn about how things are run, learn about the basic tasks, maybe you are going to specialize a little bit and learn under someone doing a very specific job and essentially where you can gain some initial experience that's going to help you get confident handling wildlife and working independently in this kind of industry in the future. I personally got a lot of my initial experience with wildlife through volunteerism and as someone who has worked on sanctuaries as well I can see how valuable volunteerism can be. However, there have definitely been some negative effects of the growing popularity of volunteerism on those of us who want to work professionally in the wildlife field. And as it grows in popularity, there is a huge growing body of organizations that are really turning it into a pretty exploitative practice. And we need to learn how to be very cautious and avoid those kind of situations and how moving forwards we can make volunteerism in the wildlife industry ethical and sustainable. If you like topics like this or if you're interested in my work then please do subscribe to my channel. I will be uploading videos all about things to do with conservation and wildlife work and animal rescue and rehabilitation. But for now let's talk about my awkward finger guns. About volunteerism. <laughs> I'm going to get the big negative chat out of the way first, okay? So it is no secret that volunteerism has led to very warped perceptions and expectations of people who work in the wildlife industry. Because it has now become so common for people to say take a gap year and go and pay to work on a wildlife sanctuary and get loads of experience. Now when you look at entry level jobs, you are expected to have one to three years of hands on experience and probably a PhD or something as well. And this is for the very basic entry level jobs. And what this expectation is doing is it's creating a massive barrier into wildlife work. Now, don't get me wrong, I completely value voluntary experience and having hands-on experience with animals. I think there is a lot that you cannot learn just from a classroom and that volunteering is essential for wildlife work, but expecting such high levels of experience at very varied and often exotic locations is just not feasible. What it's done is it's created this barrier where the majority of people who are succeeding in this field are white, able-bodied, wealthy and privileged. And that is a huge shame because wildlife work benefits from having a variety of opinions and experiences and different people to work towards solutions that are really going to be very innovative and groundbreaking. And we can't have that when everyone in the in industry looks the same and comes from the same background. And the other side of this is now that there are so many people who are willing to pay to work, once you're qualified, places are still expecting you to pay to work. Either that or they're expecting you to work for free without actually providing any benefits. And that is honestly exploitation. And is this the fault solely of volunteerism? No, absolutely not. This goes way up to the top where funding is allocated and the importance of our field is decided and honestly diminished. So it's not entirely due to volunteerism. However, we do need to start assessing what we can do with our current situation and how we can make conservation more inclusive and 
diverse. And I think a really good place to start with that is to make sure that if we are partaking in volunteerism, we are doing so ethically and sustainably, and that we are supporting organizations that are also working to support paid workers and local communities. So if volunteerism has this potentially very negative knock-on effect on the wildlife industry as a whole, why is it still being used and why am I not just advocating to abolish it completely? Wildlife sanctuaries are generally charitable organisations and NGOs. They aren't necessarily getting a lot of stable funding and a lot of the work that they do is supported by income that they generate from what they have to offer. And the costs associated with running sanctuaries, particularly when you have large volumes of animals and vet bills and food bills, is just immense. It generally cannot be covered through monthly donations. So that means sanctuaries have to start thinking a bit like a business and they have to start thinking what they can offer a consumer in order to generate income. In my experience, sanctuaries tend to go down one of two paths here. Now, obviously there are things such as tours and talks that sanctuaries can do, but again, that only generates so much income. When we're looking at the big money, you have the options of exploiting your animals, of running different tourist events and shows and and really accepting that some of the animals in your care are gonna be exploited. And for me, that is an absolute non-starter and something that I will never support. The other option is you start thinking about how you can generate income from people. What a lot of sanctuaries have done is they've realized that they have something very valuable to offer people and that people are willing to pay for that. But in order to make sure that it is being done ethically and sustainably, there are a number of things we have to consider. And that is what I'm gonna go through for the remainder of this video. This is the biggest question you get when you start talking about volunteerism. What should I be paying? What should be covered? And when should I be paying? I'm going to start with when. When should you pay to work somewhere as opposed to perhaps working for free or being paid to work? That's the dream, right? In my opinion, it is only acceptable to be paying to work somewhere when you are not qualified in the area of work and you are looking for some training. If you are already highly qualified and you could be doing this job independently, I don't really think that you should be paying to do it. In addition, you should be considering the level of responsibility you have. If you want to have no responsibility and you want instead for people to be looking after you, then yeah, maybe you could be paying for that. However, if you are expected to take on responsibility like managing a team or heading up a certain project, then you shouldn't be paying to do that. Next thing to consider is what should be included if you are paying. Now the very basic things that should be included anytime you're paying to work somewhere is food, accommodation, and training. If somewhere is telling you that you're gonna have to buy your own food or pay for your own accommodation, I would be heavily questioning what you are paying for. Now maybe this is different if you're paying a very, very, very low amount, but if anyone's asking you for, you know, a real sum of money, you should have your basic needs covered. And I'm not saying the food and accommodation needs to be super fancy. It can be very basic. It's covering your basic needs. And then the next thing is training. When I pay to be somewhere, I expect that I'm paying them and so therefore I am going to be getting something in return and that is an investment in me and my training and them helping me get my abilities up to a place where I'm not only an asset to them but an asset to any organization I'm going to work with in the future. This doesn't mean that you're going to get in-depth training into really specific areas especially if you're only going somewhere for two weeks to a month that's really not long enough for you to get really really detailed skills but what it does mean is that you should be leaving with new knowledge of the species you've worked with with how sanctuary run and a better idea of your place in this work and whether or not this work is something you want to pursue in the future. I always think of it that if I was doing a course here in the UK, I would pay for that course. I would pay for someone to teach me how to handle an animal, for example. And so why would I not pay for someone to teach me how to handle an animal when I'm volunteering elsewhere? And as someone who has trained volunteers in the past, I can tell you it takes so much time and investment to get someone to a place where you are comfortable leaving them a alone with wildlife or even just supervising them from a distance handling wildlife. It can be a dangerous situation and you want to make sure that both them and the animal are safe. And that does take time, it takes investment, and it takes a skilled person to teach you these things. And the final point here is what is a reasonable amount to spend? Now my general rule here is I don't want to be spending too much more than it would be costing me to live at home because I'm not getting the same level of food and accommodation so it shouldn't cost as much and I've had to pay 
pay for things such as flights, maybe visas, health insurance. So I don't want to be paying a stupid amount of money. So for example, I did a six month internship at one point and overall the cost came out to approximately maybe 350 pounds a month. And to me, that's really reasonable because that's less than I would be paying for accommodation here. So it doesn't even begin to touch what I'd be paying for food or travel or anything. And even though the food and accommodation was much more basic than what I would be getting perhaps in the UK, it was supplemented by some really solid training. Um, these things do tend to be cheaper when you stay longer. So the fact I stayed for six months actually made it overall cheaper. If you're only staying for say four weeks, you might end up paying a lot more. When you stay longer, it's just more beneficial for both parties and that's part of the reason it's a little bit cheaper. What is, in my opinion, unacceptable, like downright exploitation, is I saw an advert for an internship and this internship was six weeks long and they were charging 3,000 pounds for six weeks. And actually, I think this was an internship as well that was field work and on the move. So your accommodation was a tent. You pitched yourself every night. So I, what are you paying that much money for? Jeez. Honestly, I think that is downright exploitation. And I think if someone's asking for 3000 pounds for six weeks, I would be looking elsewhere. The other thing you really need to consider is what kind of work you're doing and what is the staffing situation like on the site you're visiting. The number one thing to take away from this point is you should not be doing a project independently or leading a group of people on a project doing something that you are not qualified to do. Now we tend to see this more in the humanitarian side of volunteerism, things when you're like building houses and teaching. If you don't have qualifications in construction and education back home, then you're also not qualified to do these things in another part of the world. The other thing you really need to look at in terms of making this sustainable economically is that you shouldn't be taking jobs that that local workers could be paid to do. Now, the thing is it can be difficult to know what a local worker could be paid to do and what they could not because you don't know the exact financial situation of the sanctuary. So I think a really good way to assess this is you should be seeing whether or not the jobs that happen every single day in a very structured pattern that can provide very reliable work for people is being given to local workers. They should have a really good core team of local workers that are being paid a fair wage. And if they don't, and if it's purely into national staff, I would kind of be questioning why that is. Is it a financial thing? Is it because apparently no one in the local area is qualified to do it, which honestly I'm not sure I would believe. An international workforce is not a bad thing in itself, but it should be supplementing a local workforce. This is not only important for the economy of the area, but also to ensure that your conservation is community based and is taking account of what people in the local area think and feel about the work you're doing and how you can make sure that what you're doing actually has them in mind because at the end of the day these are the people who know the land and the animals best and who are going to be living alongside them and any conservation that wants to be successful needs to take that into consideration. Very tied on to that last point is that anytime you do a placement like this, you should be so respectful of local communities. Often these kind of volunteerism opportunities take place in the global south, and it is predominantly white people from the global north who are filling these positions and taking these opportunities. It is not our job as white Western people to come to these places and tell local communities how they should be working, how they should be living with their animals and what changes they should be making. The West Western way of doing things is not automatically the right way of doing things. And therefore, when you go to these kind of places, you have to completely strip the idea from your head that you know what is best. You are there to learn and to be trained. And a huge part of that is learning about the local community and respecting the local community. And any organization that you're doing this with should also have this in mind. And it should be something that they really push when advertising their projects and something that you can clearly see on their website is something they're passionate about. And the final thing that I really want you to consider when deciding whether or not you're going to be taking part in volunteerism is picking ethical organizations. There are two benefits to this. Firstly, I know what it is like as a young 18, 19 year old to pay a lot of money and invest in going to work somewhere that you think looks like it's doing amazing things only to get there and realize your money has gone to something that you don't agree with. And it is heartbreaking. And I don't wish that experience on anyone. There is a growing number of sanctuaries today that 
do not have the best interest of their animals at heart. And if you go and spend time there, yes, you might spend a bit of time cleaning out enclosures, but then you'll also be cuddling lions or riding elephants. And I'm sorry, but when you're taking part in those activities, not only you're exploiting the animals, you're not actually learning anything about how to work with wildlife or the natural behaviors of them. And the second benefit to going with an ethical organization is that if ethics are already at the heart of that organization, they're gonna be treating their people so much better as well. And therefore it's less likely that you're gonna get there and not get any value from your time. If you need help finding an ethical wildlife sanctuary, then I have a video all about that that I will leave linked somewhere on the screen here. But my general advice is I would avoid using third party organizations and always book directly with a sanctuary that you have researched yourself. This way you always know what you're getting yourself into and also you know that any money you spent is actually going directly towards the sanctuary and not having a portion of it siphoned off to another organization. This actually also tends to help with costs. Things tend to be cheaper going directly through a sanctuary. If wildlife volunteerism is not accessible to you or is just something that you don't believe in, then there are alternatives. And honestly, I think we really need to be pushing these alternatives if we want to make wildlife work more accessible to a wider range of people. These alternatives would be things like seeing if you can find opportunities within your local area with your local wildlife. Not everything has to be with exotic species or in exciting locations, especially if you think your long-term work is gonna take place in your home country, then it is best to get experience with animals from your home country. And don't limit yourself to the kind of venues you're willing to get experience at either. Yes, wildlife sanctuaries are amazing and a great place to get experience, but it's not the only place. You can also look into rescues, you can look into anywhere that deals with domestic animals, you can look into veterinary practices. There are a lot of different venues across the country that deal with animals in some capacity. And any sort of experience or in you can get is valuable. The other thing to potentially do would be to look at university courses or college courses and see if they include any opportunities for field work or experience as part of the course. Sometimes this might include working under a PhD or master's student or going on field trips or helping out certain organizations within your area and often you don't have to pay extra or at least not a lot extra for these opportunities. And finally, just a final note on not just volunteerism, but volunteering in general. We need to make sure volunteering isn't too focused only on what it can give the individual. So often when people talk about volunteering, uh, what I hear is it's gonna look good on your CV. It's gonna boost your confidence in this, blah, blah, blah. And yes, that is all true. But volunteering is not just an opportunity to make ourselves more employable. It is an opportunity to make ourselves more aware and to help us understand issues and difficulties within the world of wildlife conservation that we wouldn't have been otherwise exposed to. And only by beginning to understand these issues and learning about our place within them can we actually move towards the kind of systemic change we need in order to make this industry more diverse and more accessible. So if you are looking to volunteer, yes, it's gonna look good on your CV, but don't let that be your main motivation. It's not all about employability, it's about understanding the world and the industry as a whole. Anyway, that is everything on volunteerism for today. If you have any differing opinions, please feel free to leave them down in the comments. I would love to hear what you think about this issue. And if you have any experience, either really good or really bad with volunteerism, let me know. Until then, I'll see you in the next video.